anyway, I did want to talk, uh, see if you had time to talk about uh, music um, and some of, uh, like, especially some of your first memories with music, like what, uh, what got you into it, um, either listening or playing? You know, that's an excellent question. Um, I think a couple of different things. Um, we grew up obviously riding millions of miles, it seemed like, uh, in cars. Uh, and, and man, the one common denominator was my dad drove and my mom was in the front seat and we had a radio, so that was big. And when eight tracks came out, oh my gosh, man, it was magical. You could actually pick the music you wanted to listen to. And you know, an eight track, um, an eight track box was, huge i mean golly man my three sisters and i and 16 eight track boxes in the back seat man there wasn't room for anything else it seemed like but uh i grew up on country music i grew up with johnny cash and and waylon jennings uh merle haggard loretta lynn patsy klein uh some of willie's early stuff i mean it, it was you know conway it was all it was that group and that's what we listened to when i got old enough to really pay attention um I listened to James Taylor and Carole King and people that wrote their own music, singer songwriters. And that's when, that's the early seventies. Okay. We got to go back to when I was 10, 11, 12 years old, early seventies. Uh, at the same time, Marty Robbins drove a race car and, uh, two things happened about simultaneously. We had a, a pastor that came to the pastor that came to the racetrack. His name was brother Bill Frazier. He was one of the first, first preachers to come and, and have church service and sometimes he would play the guitar uh and marty robbins those were the first couple of guys i ever saw live actually pick up a guitar in their hand i'd seen it on tv but pick it up and play it and i was 11 or 12 and i was like i'm gonna do that i'm gonna learn to play one of those things you know what i mean uh and bill loaned me his guitar i still have his guitar to this day but bill loaned it to me at the time i took lessons and um uh, then about the same time as, as fate would have it Randleman uh, started a, a marching band and had a band when I was in seventh grade. We just started our band program again. And I played the saxophone and played in the high school band. So music became, has always been a part as far as listening. I think everybody can say that. I always listen to music. Uh, but for some reason, about 11, 12 years old, I decided I wanted to play music. And uh, so it's been around for that long. Gotcha. I understand there's, well, there's, I, I knew about the saxophone. Was there also some clarinet or in your background too. Um, what was it about? I know you had a couple of instruments you played, but what was it about the guitar that, that kind of drew you and like really stuck with you? Okay. So here's, here's what I will say. Um, I played the saxophone, loved Vinnie Goodman, uh, you know, Miller loved just the big band music. I love big band music. I know that's crazy for a 12 or 13 year old to love big band music. Uh, but I also loved Harry Chapin and, John Prine and James Taylor and uh, Jim Croce, those guys that came along, Carol King. Um, and, and the one thing that it was a lot easier to converse with the opposite sex with a guitar in your lap than it was with a horn in your mouth. Uh, so when you're 12, 13, 14 years old, or you're in that zone a little bit, it's like, ooh, which one's cooler? Uh, and the guitar went out. But honestly, uh, once I saw Marty Robbins, really play a guitar uh, and actually watched his fingers and sat by a swimming pool in Talladega, Alabama and some of the racetracks that we would go to and he would sit by the pool and sing and play. Um, I, I was pretty much hooked on the guitar after that. Gotcha. Um, I was going to try to jog your memory banks a little bit. There was a uh, mid eighties novelty album that had a bunch of drivers on it. And uh, and enough, and enough. <laughs> <laughs> now, now you were the standout that was on that, but what else do you remember about that recording? And uh, uh, it has not aged particularly well. <laughs> How could it age? Listen, it was. It didn't age after the first week. It was bad, and it was always bad, man. That's the way it was. So here's what happened. Um, this guy came to the racetrack. I think he came with James Hilton. To be honest with you, I think James is the guy that kind of brought him around. Um, and if we go back a little bit farther in the in to nascar history you know my dad and buddy baker and pearson and kale and those guys they did an album uh in the 70s 
um, at some point in time. And you want to talk about something that didn't age well. Wow. Buddy Baker singing Butterbeans may be my favorite song ever. Richard Petty singing King of the Road. Uh, there's some classics on it, I have to admit. But so the guy came to the racetrack and um, and I had, I had been interested in music. And, and again, always interested in, in, in writing, singer songwriters. Uh, so he came and he's and he's talked to all of us, Dale Jarrett, myself, Bill Elliott, Ronnie Bouchard, all of us and said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring some Nashville songwriters. Um, they'll sit down, we'll do interviews and they'll write songs specifically about you or what they perceive to be about you. Uh, and then we'll come to Nashville and, and do it. Uh, and I'm like, shoot, yeah, man, I'm going to meet a songwriter. This is going to be cool. So um, I did, we did, we all did it. Uh, and at different times, we would go as groups and, and, and separate to Nashville and do it. Um, and, and this is what I remember more than anything else. And I, I got it. I got, have to tell you this story. So uh, part of the deal was we sing and, and, you know, I think we're getting like two cents a copy, you know, so we're not getting rich off this. This is that I, I would love to be able to tell everybody we did that horrendous album and made a ton of money, but we didn't. OK, that's that's the way it was. But. Part of the program was you come, you sing the song, and then you have to help us promote the album, you know, and promote it to, to the fans. I'm like, yeah, sure, I'm good with that. So we're going our way to Riverside, and I get a call from, from the guy that, that did it. And I don't even know his real name. This is the best part. He, he went by the name The Meat Man. That was his name. All I knew him as was The Meat Man. The Meat Man produced this thing, The Meat Man did it, whatever. So anyhow, uh, he says, can you, will you stop through Nashville and help me for the thing? I'm like, shoot, yeah, man. So, um, I stop in Nashville and he, they pick me up at the airport, uh, and they take me out to Opryland, uh, to the Grand Ole Opry. They had moved the Opry out there, you know. Um, so he said, hey, will you sing this song on, on this show? I said, sure, yeah, man, I'll sing it. And I got no problem. Uh, I've hit walls in front of people. Shoot, I'll stand up and sing. So I went on this show and it was called Nashville Now. And it was Ralph Emery, and it was a huge show. Listen, I, in my heart and in my soul to this day, I will tell you, I believed it to be a local evening show on a local cable outlet that went no farther than the city limits of Nashville, Tennessee. So I go on the Ralph Emery show, and I sing my song. We do an interview. We talk a little bit about racing. We do some stuff. Boom. I get on a plane and go to Riverside. So I'm in Riverside, and this couple of people come up to me and said, hey, man, saw you on TV. Uh, singing and I said no way and they said yeah I said we saw you in Nashville and I'm like good next day a couple more people come up and I'm like oh my god were all these people in Nashville on vacation how did they see me in Nashville and so finally about the third or fourth person I said how did you see me on TV and they, they were like well we watch you know the National Network all the time we watch Ralph Emery that's a huge show and I'm like oh my god this is a national show you mean I went on TV and sang on a show that's on national cable and they were like Sure did. And uh, so that was that was the part of the whole deal that really uh, was amazing to me because I or I would have never if I didn't know it was a national show, I would have said no. <laughs> um, I, I realize that it, the things kind of snowballed and, and you actually had a contract with with RCA yeah. there for a while. Um, and, and it sounds like you had released a single and maybe recorded some other stuff. Um, what was it like just kind of being exposed to that world? Um, but also like, I mean, are there some lost Kyle Petty tapes some, somewhere too that, that we may not know about? Uh, what was kind of your first exposure to that? Every night I pray those tapes never come out. Okay. Every night. Um, so I had a guy named Don Light, um, who was, uh, he managed, um, uh, golly, Keith Whitley. Uh, Jimmy Buffett for a little while, Steve Warner. Um, I mean, he had some, he had some really big acts, uh, about that time. If we go back to the late seventies, early eighties and, and some of that stuff. Um, so anyhow, and Don drove a mini stock out at Nashville Speedway. Uh, so we had met out there. He's really, was really good friends with, with Richard Childers, uh, and those guys. So anyhow, Don saw me on Nashville now or something and he called up and he said, Hey man, I just think, you know, racing and music and, I think there's a lot of a lot of crossover, a lot of synergy right there. And um, would you be interested? I'm like, shoot, yeah, man, I'm interested. I'm interested in anything. Listen, one thing about Kyle, one, one thing about myself, 
that's always been and will always be and has always been a knock is I will never let an opportunity pass that I won't try something. I don't want to get to be 95 and say, you know, I had a chance to do that and I didn't do it. I'm going to be that guy that's 95 that says, I had a chance to do that one time and I made a complete idiot of myself, but by God, I did it. So uh, Don called and I went to Nashville and we started doing some stuff and um, he put me up with, with a group out of Atlanta, um, with a guy out of Atlanta and I would every Wednesday night uh, for about a year or more, I would either drive to Atlanta uh, to Jimmy Carter Boulevard and play at a bar called Stonewalls. I'd do an early set and a late set, and then I'd get in the car and I'd drive home and go back to work on Friday morning or Thursday mornings. Uh, and that's what I did, just to get comfortable and to get used to it. Um, and then I, I was very, we'd, we'd go in the studio with, with a gentleman named Mark Wright and Joe Scaife and those guys. And uh, it was a lot of fun. It, it was a lot of fun. And I totally, totally learned a ton uh, at that time. I enjoyed music is something that I've always wanted to do. Music is something I've always been attracted to. Um, if I had, if I had tore down a bunch of walls early in my career, I would have probably gone off in, in the music direction. Uh, but by that time, by this time I was, I was so deep in the race and I didn't want to be a race car driver since I was five. Uh, and I just couldn't get that dream up to chase another dream. Although I had two dreams, I guess. Um, so and we, the music thing started, I ended up with, with RCA, uh, opened for Randy Travis a couple of times, opened for uh, Hank Jr., uh, the Oak Ridge Boys, the Forrester Sisters. I mean, man, I, I opened in some big places and did some big stuff and was scared to death every time I stood on stage. But it was a, it was a fun experience. And, um, you know, one day we got to a point where it wasn't really going anywhere. Uh, I wasn't really making a lot of progress. And I woke up and I'm like, you know, I got I to gotta be committed. I need to be committed to, to this. And I'd signed with the Wood Brothers and lo and behold, I'd stop the music stuff and I'd start winning a race or two and uh, things kind of went down that road. Gotcha. Well, yeah, I mean, that kind of led me to like my next question was, I mean, you, you had kind of had some early success in both fields. Um, and uh, I'd found a story where you had opened one night, like on a Friday night for Janie Fricky. And then two days later, you're in victory lane at the Coca-Cola 600. So, it, I mean, it's almost like, did, it, was that a point where you felt like you had to, like, I need to choose. I need to, there's one or the other. I need to choose. Yeah. You know, what's that saying? Jack of all trades, master of none. Uh, and and I, I think that's where I, I was going to get to that point. Um, I, I was going to get to the point where um, they were going to start detracting from each other. Um, and for me, probably at that point in time, um, the music was going to detract from the racing, um, more so than the racing would detract from the music. I thought in the beginning, being naive, you could just stand up and sing a song and that would be the end of it. And you'd go get in a race car, just like when you sing on the radio on the way to the racetrack. Um, uh, but it's a ton of work, ton of hours, uh, ton of hours on the road, just meet and greets. Uh, it's, it's like being a race car driver in a lot of ways. So all of a sudden I was, there were two jobs, uh, and I never wanted a job, period. Zero. No job. And I felt like driving a race car wasn't a job. And, and I didn't want music to become where I despised it or, or resented it because it was a job, because I enjoy it so much. Uh, so I kind of put one on a shelf for a while and said, you know, maybe I can come back to that later. Uh, never, never put my guitar on a shelf in, in 20, 30 some odd years of racing, I carried a guitar with me almost every week to a racetrack uh, and still do. Even working at NBC, every week I'll log it into a hotel somewhere and sit in a hotel room at night and play and write and do that. So uh, I haven't given up that. And that's the one bad habit that I probably have that I've carried through my entire career is dragging a guitar with me. Well, I was going to say you, you kind of, it, it stuck with you and you flash forward to, you know, today. Um, you know, what, what is the, you know, you've, you've had experiences where you've opened in bigger arenas, things like that, but, um, playing like these intimate clubs now, what, what, what is the connection that you get out of that? Because it, it's a smaller room, but there's so much spirit in those places. And, and just for reference, I live about a five minute walk from the evening muse. So I, I know like there, there's kind of a spirit to places like that. Uh, what, what do you get out of those connections? You know what, I, I, think, I think as a, 
as a musician. Um, and I'll, I'll put a musician. I don't call myself a musician. I will say that straight up. I am a so, so guitar player. Um, but, but I think as a, as a race car driver, um, as a performer and, and whatever form of entertainment you choose to perform, I, I think you draw that energy from a crowd. You draw that creativity from a crowd. Um, you, you get excited. Um, you know, I was going to the evening muse and playing open mic nights before I ever came up, before I ever went over there and, and David Childers and myself, uh, I got to play a show with David and he's really good, really good. So David and I have done a lot together, but I, I think for me, um, it is for so long and, and, and we have to go back for, and let's just go back for 20 years since Adam's accent, uh, because I really started writing a lot. I think that's how I dealt with a lot of, uh, of what went on in my life at that point in time. Um, a lot of the songs that I had, a lot of the songs that I've written, uh, a lot of the stuff that I do today, um, it, it only, only Morgan heard it. You know, only, only my family heard it. Only my parents had heard it. Only my sisters had heard it. Uh, nobody else had heard it. It was, you know, it was in my little cocoon, in my little world. Um, and that's, that's how I play. Um, so for me, it's like, okay, this is a part of me. This is a part of me, you know? And, and I think when you write something, no matter what you write, um, and I tell people all the time that, you know, some of my songs are 99% autobiographical and 1% BS. And some of my songs are 99% BS and 1% autobiographical, but there's a little bit of me in every one of them. Uh, and there's a lot of my heart in them and a lot of my soul in them. Um, and when you bear that, when you stand up on a stage or you sit down in a chair in front of a group and you play, um, and there's no reaction, it's incredibly painful. <laughs> I can say that. Uh, but you just want to, you, you want, you want a reaction one way or the other. Tell me you hate it. That's okay. You know, I'm, I'm good with that. Um, because then I, I'll, I'll know that that's, that's not a direction that's, that's a good direction or whatever. Or tell me you like it. And then that gives me a direction. So. Um, I think driving a race car, you get armadillo skin anyhow. You got to have thick skin. So, yeah, I can take criticism, but uh, I think for me, I, I, it's that connection. I think music connects, and and it's a cliche. Music connects the world. I think it does. I, I think there's something primal about it, um, where where you, it's just a beat. It's a tune. It's a it's a song. It's a it's a rhythm. Whatever it may be, um, where it it brings people together. Is that kind of what inspired uh, Quarantunes uh, for for the, these? Because uh, they, they've been, uh, you've kind of spoken to people through those. Is that what kind of went into inspiring those? You know what? Some of those songs, um, like I said, some of those songs are old songs. Some of those songs are new songs. Uh, I think for me, it is this. Um, in this day and time, um, you know, and, and we watch the motorsports community and, and we watch what it's done to the motorsports community. Um, what, what this virus has. And it's done this to so many communities. Don't, don't, and I'm not, I'm not just singling out and saying, woe is, is, is me and woe is the motorsports community. Uh, we look at all the sports, all of entertainment, everything out there. It is tough uh, for us to, to just sit at home and do nothing. I mean, the cup season goes from February to November. It's tough to sit at home and do nothing. Uh, and that's why the e-racing has been so big and so popular is because it gives us an opportunity to touch the fans uh, in a way that we know how, that, that Clint Boyer knows how to, um, that Denny Hamlin, that Dale Jr., that those guys know, know that. Um, I know just enough about music to be dangerous. So I watch um, what Jason Isbell's done. I watch what Roseanne Cash has done. I watch what all these people have done who have just an amazing talent uh, by just throwing something up on YouTube or putting something up on their Instagram account or, or on Twitter or whatever. And, you know, and, and you think to yourself, hey, man, I can sit in a room and play a guitar. Um, I'm never going to sell a million albums, but I can sit in a room and play a guitar, so I'm good with that. And um, I just said, you know, for the fans that are out there that want to know a different side of Cal Petty or, or what I, what, but other than just riding around in circles or running my mouth on TV, um, it's, it's given me an opportunity and I've connected with a lot of people, um, honestly, uh, a lot of musicians, but a lot of friends, 
and a lot of people that I've known my whole life that are like, man, I didn't know you were still doing that. And it's like, I never quit, man. I never quit. That kind of thing. So uh, it has been, it's, it's been fun and it's been a, a good interaction between myself and, and it's a different way of just making a connection without having to, to talk about and just be as one, I guess. Gotcha. And I know people think of you as being retired from driving, but you were far from retired. I mean, there you have, uh, you know, the charitable works that you've done, uh, the, the, everything with NBC. Um, you've got a second child on the way in August. Is that right? I mean, that's, that's right. How are you doing all this? I mean, how do you do it all? You know what? It, it's funny. I, I am. It's like I, I said earlier. Um, I've never had a job. You can't retire if you never had a job. Okay. Uh, and, and that's kind of the way I look at it. Uh, I've, I've been very, very blessed uh, in a lot of ways in my life. And, and I drove a race car for a while. Uh, and as you say, had an opportunity to go to work uh, in TV and now with NBC and, and working with Dale Jarrett and Chris Tavota and, and Junior and Jeff and Steve and Marty and Rick and all those guys. They're just, they're just so much fun to be around. Uh, and I get to go to the racetrack. I get to go to the racetrack. I get to see everybody. I get to see race cars. I get to get to do that part of it. Um, that's not retirement, man. That's a vacation. That's like me going, you know, me going to an amusement park every week. So that I'm, I'm good with that. Um, and, and, you know, we do the motorcycle ride and, and we've done this motorcycle ride for 25 years. Uh, this is the first year we just postponed it until next year, but, uh, you know, it, it's helped us to, to do so many things across the country for different children's hospitals and now for Victory Junction Camp. And obviously, if your junction camp is a huge part of, of, of what my years and what my days are and what I do and, and trying to raise funds there and, and do stuff like that. Um, and, you know, we're, we're talking community and talking music, talking that stuff. I, we are working on right now um, to a, a song that I've not played on any of my stuff, a song that, and myself and David Childers, we're going to put it, put it out there. Uh, and so just follow me on Twitter, follow me on Instagram. Facebook, I'll let you know when it's coming out. Um, we're going to post it and basically sell it uh, and try to raise funds for, for me, I'm going to try to raise funds for a local food bank here in Charlotte uh, because I think that affects so many people. I think that's something that's, that's beginning to raise its head, that's been lost in, in the coronavirus is people unemployed, people running out of food, not having the place to go for a hot meal, not having this or that. Uh, just the basic needs of humanity. And uh, I think the food bank is important to me. For David, uh, he has family and friends in New Orleans uh, and his money will go there. So please, if you see it posted, please donate and, and, and do that. So that'll be a different song, a new song that's coming out. But uh, I look at that, but the most important thing for me uh, is spending time with Morgan and Overton and then our new baby. Uh, I'm really, really looking forward to that. So. In a 24-hour day, it takes me about 26 hours to put in a full day. Uh, is what it seems like. But uh, you know what? You don't slow down. My dad's 83 years old. He hadn't slowed down yet. So uh, as long as he's not slowing down, if I look out and he's still going, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going. Gotcha. That's awesome. Um, I'm actually talking to David Childers uh, this afternoon, so um, I will get his perspective on yeah. what it's like and everything like that. He said uh, I've seen interviews with him where uh, you guys have uh, two very very different styles in terms of like uh, where, wh how your approach is to music, but you know, together, you know, you guys make it work and click. It seems like. Yeah. It, you know what? It is so funny. I, I, I and, and, and it, it all ties my music and racing all tie together. Um, and, and so I met a gentleman named uh, Dolphus Ramsour uh, who owns Ramsour records. And that's the, the label the Avett brothers are on. And he manages and looks after the Avett brothers. Uh, David Childress and Bob Crawford, they were, they were friends. Uh, and, and David has written a couple of songs that the Avett brothers do. So um, I met Dolph and, and we were talking about some stuff. Dolph was a huge Wood Brothers and a huge Pearson fan. Uh, so we, we just got to going back and forth and uh, we became friends and he knew I did music. And one day I just went and I, I said, Dolph, I said, man, I write these songs. I write this stuff, but I don't know if they're any good. Do, do you know someone that I can take them to and just let them hear a couple of songs and see if they're, they're any decent. Uh, and he said, yeah, I'll hook you up. So he called me with David's number. I called David and 
I walked in and it's like David and I had known each other our whole life. I, I mean, instantly we just clicked. And when we go on stage and, and we do stuff, I, I tell people, David will bring you up and then it's my turn to bring you back down. And then David will bring you back up and then I'll bring you back down. I have a tendency to write melancholy uh, and sad stuff and slow stuff. And David writes really good stuff. Uh, he's a phenomenal writer and a phenomenal performer. So uh, I've learned a lot. Crowd interaction, how to set and, and talk to the crowd and, and get them engaged, how to read a crowd a little bit better and know, well, maybe that's not the best song to play at this crowd. Let's move to a different song. So um, I, I think for me, you know, it's, it's kind of been like in a lot of ways, when I started racing, I had Richard Petty to guide me. Uh, you couldn't ask for a better, better guide and a better person to lead you down down the path and show you what you needed to do and what not to do. And uh, I think David's been that same person for me doing, doing the music and doing it the way we're doing it right now. And it's, it's uh, for David, it's about the song. It's all about the song, but the song, no matter what you write for yourself uh, and then you hope other people like it. Uh, and that's a great, great, great strategy. A great way to look at it is, and that's kind of the way it is. I write stuff that I would like to listen to, that I want to hear, uh, and then I play it. And if you like it, good. Uh, and if you don't, I'm just not your cup of tea. Uh, then you need to move on to somebody else. And that's okay, because there's enough music out there that there's somebody that's doing what you want to hear.